I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The early seasons of Rugrats are such a huge nostalgia trip for me. Having grown up watching this show since my early childhood, seeing it again always brings me right back to the good old days. The thing is though, the more I watch it, the more I realize just how morbid this show was at times. Don't get me wrong, at its core, this is a light-hearted children's show for the most part. I mean, come on, it's about literal babies and their perception of the world around them. How morbid could it possibly get? Well, you might be surprised by the answer to that question. I've talked about this show many times on my channel. We've discussed Tommy being sent to therapy as a straight up infant. We've discussed how the show tackled the passing of Chucky's mother. Heck, we've even checked out an episode that full blown depicted Chucky being executed. However, as morbid as all of those topics may get, in my opinion, they really just scratch the surface. There's a lot to this show, and the more I watch it, the more I realize that the rabbit hole of morbid Rugrats just goes deeper and deeper. And that's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're gonna check out an episode that might just hold the crown for the all-time most morbid episode of Rugrats. But first, I just want to say thank you so much for being here, and of course, thanks for being a part of my YouTube journey. I love what I do here on YouTube, and I'm so thankful for every last one of you that check out my channel, even if it's just this one video. With that being said, if you enjoy this one, be sure to drop a like and let me know what you think down in the comments. Today, the episode we're checking out is one that I've been wanting to dive into for a while now. It's kind of a weird one though, because honestly, seeing it as a kid, it really didn't phase me much. This one honestly just felt like a normal silly episode of the show. However, looking back at it as an adult, it definitely hits a lot different. We're looking at none other than the season 1 episode, Ruthless Tommy. As this episode starts out, we see Dee Dee walking around the house, confused, wondering where her car keys went. Little does she know, Tommy is in his playpen holding them. She grabs them from him and continues on her way. Stu's glued to his workbench downstairs, so I was hoping you wouldn't mind watching Tommy. Actually, I was planning on training for the decathlon this morning. Thanks, Pop. You're a prince. Have fun with Grandpa Tommy. Sure, sure. Go on. Take an old man for granted. As Dee Dee leaves, Pop turns around, forgetting to close the front door as he walks towards Tommy. He vents about his frustrations. Meanwhile, Tommy is already plotting his escape just at the sight of the open door. We see Tommy let out a big yawn and roll over onto his teddy bear, pretending that he's falling asleep. Good idea, Scout. Take a nap and keep us both out of trouble. Now, Fish Time, the old fishing network presents Swimming Downstream, the touching story of a young salmon who did. As soon as the loud snoring starts, Tommy slyly opens up one eye, noting his window of opportunity. He grabs a pair of pliers that he has hidden and opens up the pen, quickly making his way outside, being mindful to shut the door behind him. After soaking in the elation of his accomplishment, Tommy walks up to a ball that's sitting in the grass. Just then, we hear tires screech as a car pulls up, seemingly casing Tommy's house. That must be the joint right there! Number 66, right? Yeah, right. Uh, number 66. These two men seem confused as to why this house doesn't look like a millionaire's mansion, but regardless of that, they decide to seize their opportunity. We see one of them jump out and snatch Tommy, running back to the car with him. Quick, the ransom note! Dear Ronald Thump, if you ever want to see your precious little baby Thump again, bring a million smackers and unmarked bills to 22 Elm Street. P.S. We mean it, and we're very big criminals. Just ask around. Love, Bob and Mike. They attach the note to a brick and throw it at the house, which causes a loud thud that wakes Pop up. He stands up with a big stretch and walks outside to get the newspaper, which the brick conveniently landed on top of. Blasted newspaper gets hairier every day. Too many conflabbed ads, if you ask me. 
need my reading glasses. Drat. Can't tackle a newspaper this heavy without a little java. As that's happening, we cut over to Tommy with the criminals as he just cries his eyes out in a panic. You'd think that he's freaking out because he's in a car with two complete strangers who just abducted him, but it seems he's actually upset because his ball is on the floor of the car and he can't reach it. They begin to try other things to hopefully calm him down. Okay, kid. Put all your diapers in this bag and don't try anything funny. You're scaring him, genius! Take that thing off! When that doesn't work, he takes the mask off and pulls out a book about babies that he got from a newsstand heist. The book says that babies love bananas, so he demands that his friend give him a banana. Open up the hanger, kid, so the plane can fly right in. After that, the criminal trying to calm Tommy down notices the ball on the floor and decides to give it a try and lo and behold, as soon as Tommy gets the ball, he calms right down. How about that? <laughs> I did it! You know, uh, I bet I'd make a pretty good father. Not too long later, we cut over to the guys' pigsty of an apartment. The building is covered in graffiti and is falling apart, and their actual unit is just covered in trash. Meanwhile, they'd have money just sitting openly on the table. They set Tommy down, and he takes one step, only to end up slipping on a banana peel that's sitting on the floor, and it causes him to fall and lose his ball. Oh no, what now? <laughs> Here you go, Tiger. Try one of these. I don't get it. The book says it always works. Books don't know nothing, and neither do you. The kid wants milk. It don't take no rocket scientist to figure that out. They have milk, but they don't have a bottle, so they decide to rig one together using a ketchup bottle that they have in the kitchen. The two of them make their way towards the kitchen, making the mistake of leaving Tommy by himself over in the living room. Tommy looks around, catching sight of the ball on the table, and he makes his way towards it. He's unable to reach the ball, so he goes to a nearby briefcase and drags it over to use it as a step stool. As he steps up, he accidentally knocks the latch, which causes the briefcase to swing open, revealing that it's full of cash and priceless jewels. Tommy grabs a couple handfuls, and in true cartoon baby fashion, he heads right for the toilet. Hey! Hey, where'd he go? Uh-oh! We've been had! The little thief nabbed the rubies! How can you accuse the little tiger dad? He's just a baby! A baby impersonator, you mean? So what do you think? He had his partner waiting outside in the getaway stroller? The two of them catch sight of Tommy putting the gems in the toilet, and they run up to stop him. As soon as they run up, though, Tommy just kind of walks off, and they pay him no mind as both of them start to argue over who's going to be sticking their hand in the toilet to get the jewels. As both of them refuse to do it, Tommy makes his way back to the table and successfully climbs up to get the ball this time. However, he ends up tossing it, causing it to land on a makeshift shelf covered in speakers and other electronics. Tommy climbs off the table, causing the briefcase to open yet again as he makes his way towards the shelf. He climbs on a vacuum to get up to the ball, and as he does, he ends up hitting the power switch, causing the vacuum to turn on. I'm telling you, we need a plumber! Traumatized. They decide that in order to get the cash back, they need to turn the vacuum on in reverse, which then causes a giant cloud of dust and other debris to completely cloud their living room. Tommy crawls away in pursuit of his ball that the vacuum shot out, which just so happened to land right on the windowsill. Don't look now, but a million smackers is about to go out the window! Quick, grab him! Yeah! <laughs> 
Tommy stands right in the middle of the living room, bouncing his ball, as the two of them race up the multiple flights of stairs to get back to their apartment. Upon arrival, they just stand there, watching him happily bouncing the ball, thinking that he's plotting his next move carefully. The two come to an agreement that there has to be an easier way to make millions of dollars, and just like that, we cut right back to Tommy's house. Pop is sleeping in his chair, completely oblivious to the fact that Tommy is missing. Just then, Stu comes up from his work, and Pop wakes up. How's Tommy? Sleeping, I expect. Hasn't made a peep all afternoon. Good, good. What's this? Came with a newspaper. Must be the bell. Dear Ronald Thump. Please, take him back, please. We learned our lesson, and we're very sorry, Mr. Thump. Who were those guys? The letter continues to fly freely through the wind until, conveniently, it flies into the window of the kidnapper's car. It lands directly over the driver's eyes, causing him to crash into a fire hydrant. Since they're not wearing their seatbelts, they're ejected right through the windshield, and they end up crashing through the rear window of a cop car. I hate when this happens. Boy, are you guys in trouble. Running a red light, destroying public property. Who, oh boy. What's that? Harry, you're not gonna believe this. Back at Tommy's house, Stu and Pop sit on the stoop, looking disturbed. That is, until Dee Dee shows up. When she says hi to Tommy, Stu and Pop look at each other with a look that seems in agreement that they're not going to bring up what happened today. I brought something just for you, Tommy. He probably needs a little stimulation after such a quiet day. Here, Tommy! <laughs> Right out the gate, I have to commend Rugrats for the way that they tackle these kinds of stories. They do it in a way that gives me such mixed feelings. Like, it's interesting because this one doesn't exactly have me questioning how they got away with showing this episode to kids, it more has me questioning why this episode didn't phase me when I was a kid. It's interesting because they tackled these morbid topics in a way that in all reality wasn't really too scary to their audience of children. On the other hand, as an adult, I'm realizing just how jarring this subject is. This is something that I feel like they did on purpose. It feels like they kind of planned this approach in a specific way that wouldn't shock kids, but it would leave adults here like, wait, this episode is literally about Tommy getting kidnapped by career criminals? It reminds me ever so slightly of how Rocco's modern life slipped in so many innuendos in a way that would go over kids' heads, but the adults would more often than not be able to connect the dots. It felt like Rugrats purposefully did that same kind of thing, but instead of innuendos, they did it with these morbid moments that they would sneak in. Whether that was actually the case or not though, I definitely have to point out the fact that odds are, this episode might be more jarring for me than it is for you depending on whether or not you have kids. Like for me, this episode completely spikes my inner parental fears. Just watching this episode has me feeling like I need to go check on my kiddos even though I know good and well that they're peacefully sleeping in their bedrooms right now. It's just one of those things where this episode makes you think. As a parent, it makes you wonder, what if that was my kid? And honestly, that is terrifying. That's all too real of a concern in this day and age, with human trafficking at an all-time high. Outside of my own worries and fears though, there is so much to this episode that has me pondering. I do have to say, it was kind of odd that Tommy seemed rather unfazed by being in the car with these complete strangers, but I do have a theory as to why that was the case. By all means, he was crying and very upset, but pretty much through the whole episode it seemed as if he was only crying because he didn't have his ball. It seemed like he had no idea that these men were strangers. Now, you might be thinking, well, he's an infant, of course he doesn't know any different. But the thing is, that does not make any sense. We know by this point in the series that Tommy knows good and well who his parents are, who his friends are, and even who his friends' parents are. Like, sure, he may not know their names, but he knows, for example, who Chucky's dad is, or who Phil and Lil's parents are. 
Like, it's been established that Tommy has the mental capacity to identify people based on their looks, and he's familiar with people that he interacts with, at least semi-regularly. It's safe to say that Tommy realized that he had no idea who these guys were. One way we can confirm this is by the face that Tommy made while they tried feeding him that banana in the car. That look just screams unsure and nervous about taking food from them. That expression told me pretty much everything I needed to know about where Tommy was at mentally in this episode. Now, my theory on this one is essentially that this episode is meant to serve as a testament to how strong Tommy is. You can tell that this whole ordeal bothered him internally. This is evidenced by the fact that in the end, his mom gives him a toy banana, and instead of being happy, the banana makes him cry. This right here tells us that this situation left Tommy with some trauma. He had bad feelings about the banana in the end because now he relates bananas to these strange men that forcefully kidnapped him. Just seeing that banana was enough to trigger him extremely. However, while he was in the car with these men, and when he was in their apartment, he held it together very well. Like we established already, he cried about losing his ball, and that was pretty much it. It seemed as if he essentially caused enough trouble until they wanted to take him home, which honestly could have definitely been on purpose. I mean, in the beginning of this episode, it's immediately established how much of a well thought out trickster Tommy can be. We see him full-blown plot his escape and trick his own grandfather by pretending to fall asleep. So, by all means, his behavior and all of the things that he did could have certainly been planned out methodically. I do have to say though, one thing I can't help but wonder is why in the end these two didn't just leave Tommy in the yard where they found him. If you think about it, there was really no need for them to go to the door and apologize. Especially considering that these guys are depicted as career criminals who just kind of don't give a damn. By all means, one of them seemed to have a more nurturing nature than the other, but at their core, they're a couple of sociopaths who literally stole someone's child in an effort to get millions of dollars of ransom money. Odds are, if they didn't get out of that car and explain themselves to Stu, they may not have ended up getting in the accident that led to them getting arrested. In all reality though, that is a huge testament to how dumb that these two criminals are. I do also have to point out that the two kidnappers from this episode are meant to be a parody of Harry and Marv, the burglars from the movie Home Alone. With, of course, the plot of this episode very loosely resembling the plot of that movie, more or less encompassing the story of a child outwitting two dim-witted criminals who definitely don't have any positive intentions. Outside of those things though, there are a few other random things that I certainly have to bring up as it relates to this episode. Taking it from the top, I have to take a second to acknowledge how ironic that Grandpa Lou is. In the beginning, Dee Dee asks him to watch Tommy, and his response was that he was planning on training for the decathlon. Outside of that, there's also another episode where we see him being a wrestler and taking on the McNulty boys' grandfather. All the meanwhile though, this man can't even stay awake long enough to tell a story or watch a TV show. Not to mention the fact that his back is absolutely thrashed from sleeping on his trash mattress for so many years. It's just so ironic that he's portrayed as always being exhausted and sometimes being in extreme pain, yet he's competing in decathlons and full contact sports. Pivoting in a different direction though, I certainly have to bring up the Donald Trump reference in this episode. I find it hilarious because I can't in a million years see that man living in a middle class house like this one. There's absolutely no way that the real estate mogul who got a small loan of a million dollars from his father is going to be living in a house such as this. It's just kind of hilarious considering that these criminals were dumb enough to think that a guy like him would live in this kind of neighborhood to begin with. It's also kind of funny looking back at this one with our 2024 mindset though. Back then, in the early 90s, they chose to spoof Donald Trump because he was just a prominently known rich person back then, not the former president that we all know him as nowadays. Looking back with the context we have today, it's interesting to think that, like, if this episode was made in this day and age, they wouldn't be depicting this crime against just a rich person, it'd be depicted against someone who was once the leader of an entire country, which would probably come with a whole nother slew of further legal troubles for them. Aside from that though, I also have to question the whole banana thing in this episode. 
First of all, why does this man just randomly have a banana in his coat pocket in the car? Also, how did the other guy know that he was packing a banana? Is he always carrying a banana? Is that like their thing? I don't know, maybe they put it under their shirts and pretend like they're holding a gun? Furthermore though, I can't help but point out that when they got to the apartment, they walk through the door and within seconds, the guy who was demanding a banana from his friend in the car pulls a banana out of his own coat pocket. It's like, sir, if you had your own banana this whole time, why did you demand your friend give up his banana to give to Tommy? I don't know, maybe he needed the extra potassium. All things considered though, their use of bananas throughout this episode is something that definitely just felt really random. Now, another thing that really left me questioning these criminals though, was how Tommy dropped their rubies in the toilet and they just straight up both refused to stick their hands in to get the jewels, that are potentially priceless. Like, I know you can't believe everything you read online, but according to the International Gem Society, fine quality rubies have sold for record highs of $1 million per carat. Yet, these guys are refusing to just stick their hands in a toilet for a few seconds to recover them? Meanwhile, I'm over here full blown ready to go bobbing for rubies in their toilet to the tune of a million dollars per carat. Like, just my hand? That's nothing, I'll dive head first into that toilet for that much money. Speaking of diving head first though, I also can't help but wonder how it is that these two guys literally dove head first from at least a second story window and came back up with absolutely no injuries. By all means, it's cartoon logic at play, of course, but like, soaking this episode in for all of its morbid implications has me wondering about how much darker it could have been. Like, imagine if, for example, they didn't survive that fall. Then the police come to investigate what happened, and they go up to their apartment and find not only all of this stolen stuff, but also a baby that these two straight up abducted. Of course, that wasn't the case, but still, the point stands. I also can't help but bring up that car accident in the end. Like, them getting full-blown ejected through the windshield and then through the back of that cop car? Like, there is very, very slim chance of them surviving that. Again though, of course, cartoon logic, what are you gonna do? Just the morbid nature of this episode has me looking back at it and wondering just how much more they really could have pushed the envelope in this one. But what do you guys think? Do you find this episode to be super morbid? Also, I'm curious, would you stick a hand in these guys' toilet for the chance of getting a million dollar ruby? Let me know in the comments down below, I always love seeing your guys' feedback. Of course, shoutouts with all the love in the world to my patrons, especially you guys in the true 90s kids tier. I genuinely appreciate you all for being such an integral part of keeping things up and running around here. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like and give a little praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it pushes this video to everyone else. And as always, thank you all so, so, so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you guys in the next one. Peace. Wait, you're still here? Huh. Okay, well, while I still got you, how about we celebrate Super Thanks Sunday together? If you're not familiar, this is the part of the video where I take some time to personally thank some people who donated to me here on YouTube using the Super Thanks button. Now, featured at the end of the video by popular demand, and because, well, that just kind of makes sense, and I'm a huge dingus who didn't really think that through. Of course, no pressure to donate, but if you want a shout out, feel free to donate using the Super Thanks button below this video. Also, if you've been waiting for your donation shout out, thank you so much for being patient. I skipped Super Thanks Sunday last week because that as told by Ginger video that I made literally ate up all of my time and I wasn't able to get a Sunday video finished in time. However, in an effort to catch up, I'm going to be getting through as many as I can today. First up, we have the Kate King 9400 who donated $5 and said, I just want to say that anecdote where you worked hard in order to get a wedding ring for your then girlfriend was very sweet. First of all, thank you so much for your donation, my friend, and of course, for the kind words. In case you guys missed it, this was in reference to a story I told in my recent video about Hugh Neutron. I told the story of how when I was 19, I worked at Subway and couldn't afford the ring that I wanted to propose to my wife with, so I put in a ton of extra effort slinging sandwiches and being as charismatic as I could in an effort to save my tips up so that I could afford the ring. This, even 10 years later, is still one of my proudest moments of my life. I love my wife more than words could ever say, and to be a little Gomez Adams about it, I worship the rain that waters the grass that she walks on. 
honestly, I look back at that memory with so much fondness, and I'm glad I got the chance to share that with you guys. Thanks again for your donation, Kate King. I really appreciate you. Next up, we have Rokan Gaming, who donated five bucks and said, I'm in the Air Force, and what I do is I maintain and inspect ejection seats for the A-10 and F-16 planes in Korea. In our shop, on my particular shift, there's four to five guys that work around. In our downtime, I'll put your videos on audio through the speaker and listen in. At home though, I'll play Minecraft and watch your videos on my second monitor. Have a great one from Osan Air Base. This is just so crazy. It blows my mind to hear stories about what my audio-only gang is up to while they listen to my videos. This right here might be one of the most unique ones that I've seen yet. On top of that though, it still just leaves me dumbfounded that these videos reach people all over the world. It just warms my little old heart to know that even though you're across the globe, we still get to enjoy a nice nostalgic walk down memory lane together. Thank you so much for your support, my friend. I really appreciate it. Next up, we have Rastabaugh1479, who donated 10 bucks just to say thanks. And you, my friend, are the absolute sweetest. Thank you, Rastabaugh. Your support really helps me and my family a ton, and I really can't thank you enough for that. I'm currently saving up for my daughter's 10th birthday, and all of these donations are going directly to that right now, so I really want to thank you for helping me make that a special day for her. I genuinely appreciate your support so much. Next up, we have Hitlo for the win, 9804, or as I like to call them, my resident flying Dutchman. They donated five bucks and said, Babe, wake up, Sean dropped a new video, and it's Danny Phantom! Keep up with the amazing content, my friend. First of all, I can't stress enough how much I love these comments. On nearly every video I make, I get a babe wake up comment, and it always gets a good chuckle out of me. Thank you so much for always putting a smile on my face, my friend, and of course, thank you so much for your donation. I really appreciate it, and I hope you know that I always look forward to seeing your comments. Next up, we have Wolfie Link, who donated five bucks and said, Yo, most of the time I'm an audio-only listener. I've been listening to your videos while processing cadaveric human adipose tissue for experiments. Definitely keeps my mood up while I'm doing these lengthy procedures. Never lose your spark. I love your videos and save them for those processing days. Thanks, man. Okay, hold on. Processing what now? Hold on, let, let me Google this really quick. Give me just a sec. What is adipose tissue? Okay, it's a connective tissue that extends throughout your body, otherwise known as body fat. Okay, hold on. This is just mind-blowing, dude. It's really interesting to me to learn how many of you guys are doing scientific experiments while listening to my voice. That just really is a huge thing for me to take in. I'm so thankful that I get to keep you company while you're processing specimens, and more than anything, I really want to thank you specifically for what you said about not losing my spark. I really needed to hear those words right now, and I can't thank you enough for your support and for being so kind. Best of luck with all your future experiments, my friend, and I look forward to our next nostalgic walk down memory lane on your upcoming processing days. Next up, we have Nah, you good 29 who donated $2 just to say thanks, and I really, really can't thank you enough, my friend. It means the world to me that you enjoy my videos enough to donate to me and my family. I really appreciate your support and for being a part of my YouTube journey. Next up, we have Stopper88, who donated two bucks and said, Thanks for all the great content from my childhood. Your research is actually very good, so thanks. Aw, thank you so much, friend. Those words really mean a ton to me. My approach to research is very different, and it means a lot to me to have that recognized. I put a big emphasis on taking multiple avenues when it comes to doing research so that I can compile as much correct info that I can. Sure, sometimes I miss a deleted scene because I'm not perfect, but with that being said, I absolutely try my best, and it warms my heart to have that recognized. Thank you so much for your support and for your kind words. Next up, we have TonyIs138, who donated 10 bucks and said, Tom DeLonge is the greatest songwriter, Sinister Gates is the greatest guitar player, and Billy Mays is the best salesman. Also, I'm the greatest Pokemon Go player. Now, this is just so random, and I absolutely love it. Shout out Blink-182 and Avenge Sevenfold, and of course, RIP to Billy Mays. 
Also, of course, Team Instinct for the win, obviously. Thanks so much for your donation, my friend, and your comment put a big smile on my face. I really appreciate you. Next up, we have Ooh19, who donated $2 just to say thanks. And of course, thank you so much as well, my friend. Your support is so incredibly helpful to me, and I really can't thank you enough for it. Next up in line, we have Remus Kitty 8686 who donated $2 Canadian and said, If I could donate more, I would, but unfortunately, I am broke. I just want to thank you. I suffer with mental stuff, and your videos help to keep my mind off of all that. Honestly, friend, I really can't thank you enough. I have said it before, and I'll say it again. These $2 donations are just as important to me as any other. That's your hard-earned money that you were kind enough to donate to me, and I am eternally grateful for that. It means the world to me that my videos are able to keep your mind off of the mental stuff. For me, making them helps me a ton with my own mental stuff. It comes in waves, but drowning myself in these videos definitely has a therapeutic effect on me, and it really means a lot that they make a difference for the mental health of others as well. Thank you so, so, so much for your support, and of course for the kind words, my friend. I genuinely can't thank you enough for being a part of my YouTube journey and for being here. When the waves hit hard, it's comments like this that are in my mind helping me bear the storm, and I can't thank you enough for that. Next up, we have Fat Mario Heads, who donated $5 on my video about Mr. Meaty, and said, to quote lyrics from a King Diamond song, these puppets are oh so grotesque. Great work as usual, Sean. Now, I love this so much. If you can't tell by Giraffe Sean's shirt, I'm a huge metal fan, and King Diamond is one of my all-time favorites. His vocal range is insane, and the way he can go from his raspy voice to an insanely high-pitched falsetto is just stunning. It's even more insane to think that he's nearly 70 years old and still performing just as good as he always has. I cannot wait to hear the album that he's been working on for the last few years. Even more important than that though, thank you so much for your support and for your donation, friend. I genuinely appreciate you being here, and thanks for the sick reference. That brought me so much joy. And next up, we have Sheev Hernandez3869, who donated $2 and said, Hey man, thanks for the videos you send out each time it comes out. Also, I always wonder, have you ever heard the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? If not, I thought not. It's not a story the Jedi would tell you. It's a Sith legend. Ah, yes. Darth Plagueis was a dark lord of the Sith. So powerful and so wise, he could use the Force to influence the midichlorians, to create life. He had such a knowledge of the dark side, he could even keep the ones he cared about from dying. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. He became so powerful, the only thing he was afraid of was losing his power. Which, eventually, of course, he did. Unfortunately, he taught his apprentice everything he knew. Then his apprentice killed him in his sleep. Ironic. He could save others from death, but not himself. I'm sorry, guys. I'm a sucker for a good copy pasta. Thank you so much for your donation and for a good laugh, my friend. I genuinely appreciate you. With that, I am very, very tired right now, so we're gonna put a pin in Super Thanks Sunday right here. Until next week, of course. Honestly, I still have just way too many to get through, but I'm so excited to do that. I really, really enjoy this time with you guys. It makes me happy to be able to have these weekly segments because it kind of gives me the chance to veer away from Nicktoons for a bit and just kind of share a bit about myself. It makes me feel like I have the chance to connect with you all in a really special way, and I'm super thankful for that. <laughs> super thankful. More than anything, thank you so much to those of you who stuck around to the end of this Super Thanks Sunday. If you don't mind me asking, would you do me a huge favor and let me know that you made it to the end by leaving me a comment down below letting me know where you're watching from. Planet, continent, country, state, wherever you want to go with, I don't really care. I'm going to be hanging out in the comments section of this video for a while, and I really want to be able to give a personal thanks to you guys who made it to the end while I'm there, so if you don't mind, I'd really appreciate it. And of course, while I've got you here now, thank you so much for watching, and I hope y'all have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye!